Good evening. Thank you and welcome to the September 27th regular meeting of the Town Council and Robert F. Recent Council Chambers. Please rise for a moment of silence. All have a quick please. Please, please pretend 
you should get the around that. Once again, lots of, lots of applause for the indoor champion. So the reason, uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and the Council. Um, the reason why we have suggested this to the steering committee was to attempt to mitigate the uh, extreme lead times in obtaining electrical switchgear. If we were to wait uh, for the normal bid process based on the current schedule, we wouldn't expect to receive approval to proceed to roughly mid January at this point. Electrical switchgear can take upwards of one year to obtain right now from approval. So the concern with that being is that it would have a detrimental effect to the back end of the overall construction schedule, and thus having a, a more significant cost impact to the town of Long. So what we would be asking to do is solicit multiple prices from uh, electrical switchgear suppliers, uh, share that, of course, with the steering committee, uh, and Allison and release the gear uh, within the next month or so. So theoretically picking up approximately two months uh, from what the normal process would be. Again, trying to maintain the overall anticipated construction schedule for the project. And just to add to that, um, I did work with the purchasing agent and the controller to really narrow down all the options and you know, to look at every avenue and we do feel like this is the most beneficial is three and a half months typical for a bid? Did you say you would have until January for the typical bid process? If once we go out to bid, it's about an eight-week period, so about four weeks for the bid cycle, 
and then about four weeks for us to have detailed sewer reviews with all those contractors as your construction manager, and then develop a uh, AIA GMP amendment to present to the steering committee. And then how how will you be obtained quotes? How who do you who do you go to or how how do you know to ask for? We typically partner with a, uh, an electrician that we have good experience with. Uh, we have precedence in doing this type of approach recently because of the environment that we're all living in right now um, on other municipal projects. Uh, so they go to the main vendors, which are common throughout the state of Connecticut, that supply electrical switch gear for all construction projects. So we have those folks to share. Uh, again, it's just a it's a Concept of trying to pick up time on the overall duration. It's not um, spending money that you weren't going to spend already as part of the future electrical bid package, just spending it sooner in order to mitigate costs on the back end and delays. Sure, yeah, I, I certainly understand uh, trying to save the time. I guess my concern going into this way would be that you know, if you have soliciting that pricing, that eventual pricing will be part of our guaranteed maximum price that will be submitted to the town uh, at this point based on the schedule in the early part of December. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm concerned about the precedent because what I've heard here essentially applies to anything is there some distinction here? This is one singular component of the overall uh, construction project of the police department that has had extreme uh, concern about delivery of lead times. Um, we have taken this approach in, again, as I said earlier, multiple municipalities to try to mitigate that, again, with the idea of getting it in saving the town openly money at the back end of the project because of future schedule delays. It's not any other component of the project currently. It's just the electrical switch gear, the main gear to power the new 100 Barnes Road project. And how much do you estimate would save the town by doing this? Well, the math on the back end, depending on when we get it, would save two to three months, like I, I had done the math earlier. Uh, in our general conditions alone, from our supervision, is in, I think, Allison reported a memo to you at approximately the $75,000 range. Uh, but also, what you're mitigating is really uh, not necessarily 100% quantifiable, is in the bids, the anticipation of a longer schedule and escalation that contractors have to build in their bids, so we're trying to make sure that we have a very well-defined construction schedule. So when those bids come in, it's not you know there's not any unforeseen conditions as it relates to the overall end date because of the And your you would be the individual um, soliciting the bids, so to speak, Correct. the contractual arrangement. How long do you estimate it will take you? Your duty in regards to that? Oh, I have already uh, started a preliminary process associated with that um, just to understand what the cost would be. I would think it will be resolved and priced out and shared with the steering committee by the next meeting. Next meeting of the steering committee. So, about uh, two weeks. Okay. Right. So, understanding that. You've engaged in activity that hasn't been authorized with regard to this. So let's just say that we empowered our purposing department to do the same exact thing. Is there something that precludes the same sort of time frame? So I heard about the eight weeks, but that's internally created, correct? We we can set up any bid process that we potentially want. So let's sort of please educate. Well, our, our recommendation, uh, as we had explained to the steering committee, was that trying to solicit a separate bid for just the switch gear 
was not going to be something that was necessarily desirable from the main electrical contractors that would eventually look at the total electrical package for your new police department. Uh, it's not something that is typically done, um, not in my previous experience. Uh, and I think it just comes back to, I think, a lack of interest in trying to pursue a singular competitive bid in a public market to um, obtain that type of pricing. Okay, my, my question at this time, what we heard initially was the problem with this potential eight weeks of term, right? So that eight weeks is created by the town, correct? So, so just to be more clear on the math, we're anticipating to be out to bid on the total project within the next few weeks. Uh, we would anticipate on the current schedule to provide a guaranteed maximum price to the town about December 5th, uh, and then present it, of course, uh, to the council. Uh, the dates are escaping me, but the 12th and 13th of December. And then one month from there, I believe there's a waiting period before we have approval to proceed and authorize those contractors to move forward. That would be roughly mid-January of 2023 before we could release the prime electrical contract. So that's the math that if we can, in the next few weeks to a month, be able to release the switchgear, we're picking up you know, that time frame from that period till roughly mid-January. And you representing the town in this process, has somebody had you sign off on the ethics code for the town? Our purchasing agent falls within the ethics code. Is that, are those requirements falling upon you as well as representing our town? Well, um, again, I, I don't know of having signed off on the town's ethics code in any way. We have a contract with the town as your construction manager. Um, I can, again, just uh, forgive me for repeating myself, I've uh, implemented this process with other municipalities successfully. Um, there's no financial gain associated with us to be able to do this. It's really just acting on your behalf uh, to try to mitigate the concerns that I've already explained. Well, I understand the representation, but certainly like our purchasing agent normally handles these things. Mm -hmm. um, he is constrained by our ethics code to protect, you know, potentially negotiate with or approve a bid from a company that he has an interest in. Let's just say that's the most egregious. And I'm just trying to figure out if we deviate from our normal process, if it is anticipated that you will fall within the same legal conduct. And, and what I'm hearing is no. I mean, it was, I don't know if anybody's ever considered this. I, I, I have not heard that question before, Mr. Counselor, um, uh, being posed to me, uh, other than just knowing how I've conducted myself and, and how I would intend to under the Afrikan along for it is certainly you know, at the highest standards. No, and I, I, I cast no dispersions, but, uh, or ask her, um, but we are required. Uh, you know, we make our purchasing agent sign off on that. You know, and I, I trust our purchasing agent, right? We're sort of putting you in place of that individual. So uh, I'm just trying to wrap my arms around that because this is unusual and our ordinances do not provide for this automatic deviation. So you're coming to us asking for special permission and I'm analyzing the whole thing. Uh, those are my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, any other questions, comments, or concerns from the council? Are there any from the public? Seeing none, no final comments from the council. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to authorize the station steering committee to obtain quotes for electrical switch gear bid waiver request in the estimated amount of eighty thousand to one hundred thousand dollars. Is there a so moved. Second. So moved and seconded. Madam um, Clerk, will you please call the roll?
Harmony? No. Fishline? No. Laughlin? Yes. Maroon? Yes. Tata? No. Tessa? Yes. Nandri? Yes. Uh, there were four yeses and three noes, but the council requires uh, five to take action, so the motion fits. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to clear something up. The law covers what was being alluded to, where there'd be a situation of you know, underhanded, uh, you know, dealing with someone, you're getting a kickback or whatever. Our ethics code is one thing, but law covers that as well. So we are adequately protected. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All the question and answer period. Is there anybody from the public who would wish to speak who wants to go first? Mr. Gross. Good evening, Bob Gross, Longhill Road. Our, well, I guess I'll ask the question on the phone. It's about the grant for the train station. Um, has, it, has the town submitted its application already? Do you want to wait until that agenda? Well, can I? I'll ask, I have some questions on that. Will we be able to ask? Because just the way it's worded on here, sometimes you don't let us go outside what's in the motion here. If it's reasonably connected, I would say. Sure. Yes. And so it's your. And I'm not. I just. You know, just no, all right, I'm just asking. So that one I'll it. Um, has the town gone out for is this the first application we've applied for under this grant? Mr. Mayor. This is the first time I've applied for this grant. As far as I know, it's a very new grant. Um, I don't believe so, but I, I I'm not absolutely certain, but I believe it's a very new grant. And do we how do you plan on funding this grant? It's almost $2 million. Is that in the budget? Sure, sure, I think that's all uh, that can be dealt with under the subject right. matter of the agenda. All right, on a question. Um, do you have, the way you're building it out, do you have a tenant or a specific person or entity in mind for this project? I think that also would fall under the agenda okay. when we have the right. presenters here. And then on it, um, I, I guess most of these will fall, if you're telling me most of these will fall under them. Then one quick question. I will give you extraordinary leeway on this agenda. I don't want to come to the public if that's Thank, Thank you very much. Well, and then just so you know, nobody else. All right. I know you're making a joke. I know everybody will treat it equally and fair by the sound, so they're always good. Thank you. Um, on here, you're asking for $15,000 for ARPA to the chair, to the controller. How much have we allocated and spent so far on ARPA? You're asking for $15,000 more. The original appropriation was $25,000. We spent, I think, about $24,000. And that's all for the consultant? All for the consultant. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll end the software and the applications. Yeah, that's their software. Yes. So it's all to the it was all to the consultant. Nothing's been spent on any not a penny has been given to anybody in need. Nothing's been approved. Thank you. Mr. Comerford. We'll come up for project time. <laughs> Um, Mayor, can you indulge us with what actually took place with the demolition of the brothers building down there? The building was demolished and removed. Okay, so was the bid um, that was given to the contractor follow? As far as I know, it was. So you're not familiar with the foundation was? 
I'm not familiar with any of the details of the, the pit document um, or, or uh, the compliance or non-compliance with regard to work performed. I believe, given that we paid the bill and signed off on by the department, that it was done in accordance with what the language is and in accordance with customary business standards. Okay, so you're of the opinion that the contractor subscribed to exactly what the bid stated. Um, I had a discussion yesterday with Chris Hall, and there's, in my opinion, there's been some problems that came up. And part of the bid did number 18-144 demolition of Brothers restaurant clearly states, clearly states, Shack, remove all the foundation walls. Somebody posted on Facebook while the work was getting done. I happened to be out of state at the time. I happened to see it. And in my opinion, it appeared that the walls weren't removed. And that it, it was an oh no. And then public works had to go down there and do the work that the contractor never fulfilled. But you're in charge of that. You will receive that department, and the people that work in this case, the director of public works, works for you and is responsible for you. And is it fair for me to say, as you're sitting here today, you weren't aware of any of this? I was aware of the general project, the need to remove the building. The details were handled by the department. My knowledge was handled appropriately, and uh, you're raising questions about it. We can look into the questions, but. Uh, we're, we're not going to get very far into details because I'm not familiar with all of the details, and that can be reviewed. So, sh should the director of public works come to you and tell you this? He would not have time in his day nor mine to reviewing every project that is performed either by pro pro public works or private contractors and go over the details of it. We can't function that way. There has to be greater efficiency. So. They determine when something is completed. They should be using the proper legal as well as uh, customary construction practices, and we move forward from that. If there's a problem, we can investigate it, determine if there is a problem or not. Okay, so to be crystal clear, we're probably over here in minutes. Um, not probably, but okay. At least I'm consistent. So, at the end of the day, the contractor never did what it was required to do. Public works had to go down there, in my opinion, and excavate down approximately 8, 10 feet, and remove all the walls, haul all the stuff away, pay for the work. So, the taxpayers, everybody here, everybody in living color watching this, paid twice. Paid twice, and our top administrator knows nothing about it. Nothing. So the question is, is how many other times does this have happened? Is he so busy that we're allowed to pay people twice for something that wasn't done the first time? So I'll, my two minutes is up. I'll be back at the next person's office. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, three minutes too, but anybody else have any other questions or comments before this room or for the microphone? <clears throat> Welcome to Five Broadview Drive. Um, YouTube, government TV puts these meetings on YouTube. Does that still happen? Do we know? It does. Okay, so right now it's on YouTube? Uh, there is a camera issue. I don't know if it's live tonight. It's no. not live tonight, but typically it is. I don't believe the last meeting was either. This morning. Yes, it was. Oh, it was. This is the first one that wasn't. So this is the first one. The question, I guess, would probably be to the water department. YouTube owns the rights to whatever is on their channel, not the town of Wellington, because I threw freedom of information. I asked for a copy of one of the town council meetings, and it had to go, they had to hire someone else out because it was on YouTube. They didn't have the capacity to digitally transfer it, all these other different excuses. The point is that, or the question I have from the law department is that's not the town's possession, that's YouTube's. So, those moments in time that are on YouTube, we don't have any fact, any hard copy 
digital DVD to back up the fires. Is that the case? I don't know anything about YouTube's legal rights, but you, my understanding was you asked for a copy of the meeting in the DVD, they didn't have the technology to turn it into a DVD, and told you, under the FOI Act, that if you wanted a copy on the DVD, they had to send it out for such service. That's my recollection. Is that not what happened? You wanted it on a DVD? We don't, we don't have to have that technology, but we, we can, if somebody can do it at a cost, and you pay the actual cost, you can have it that way. I believe that's a service we don't necessarily provide on that's on YouTube. You have access to it for YouTube. But, but the question is, if, if something happened to YouTube in the cloud or something, there's no physical and anything tangible. As it doesn't have to be a deep recording this meeting. This does not have to be on TV. It doesn't have to be video. It's okay. not required. Okay, so it's just a minute that, that, that Okay. Um, okay. Well, it's a recording, too, but it doesn't have to be video. There's a tape recording? We, we also have it on the server. It's on the server we, also. We, we, exactly. We do maintain a copy. The government does. Okay. Um, my next question. I was on the state again, and the sale of the property between Center Street Brewery and the thrift store was sold to, I believe, the capital for 18000 whatever. I totally was not in support of that, number one, because it didn't make sense to me. Why would you be giving up? Property that the town owned for measly eighteen thousand dollars. But more importantly, it's come to my attention, in my opinion, that Dick Kaplan has always wanted to shut that road down, that throughway. Was that ever looked into? Because, in my opinion, he, when I talked to the guy that owned the brewery, he was under the impression that Dick Kaplan clearly wanted them because I went by there a couple of times and they sectioned it off. So, does the town have a legal easement or a right of way over that property? Because the town or the town's people have been using it for God knows how long. Or can he technically cut it off? If you're talking about the right of way between the church property and Mr. Kaplan's property, that is recorded as an easement over that land. The town does not have any right to use that, it's not a public way at all. We have Wallace Street, or I'm not sure which Wallace it is, to the rear of the property. But um, we, have, we have, as a government, no rights to that passageway between uh, those two properties. But I'm talking about on Wallace Street. We came up Wallace Street, took the left, to go toward the back of where Kaplan's is. That's, that's all private property. Right. So. I was just kind of curious if the council knew that that was potentially the intent here. Because then it becomes landlocked and also it, it causes a problem because he theoretically could shut the thing down. And I think that that was the intent. The, the land sold. Not the land sold. I'm talking about if you were to come up Wallace Avenue and take a left before Center Street Brewery, where they block that's, that's all private property. Right. And it's been private property. There's been no change in that. Then, then, then my final question, and I appreciate this. Then when the, when the town put the sidewalks in there, why did they continue the sidewalks all the way through, as opposed to putting ramps in there so that cars can still penetrate through property that we don't own? We provided sidewalks and the appropriate ADA uh, curb cuts in order to accent walls, we did not put those on private property. <coughs> we put them on town-owned property, but the, the, the six-inch concrete sidewalk should have been continuous from Center Street all the way to the end of the other side of Center Street Brewery, so that you, you would say it yourself, it's private, it's private property, but yet we made it accessible by putting two separate ramps in 20 feet apart. So clearly, any vehicles can still go through there. I don't understand why. So you're saying we shouldn't? We should have sealed off the ability of Mr. Kaplan, his uh, invitees to his business, seal off their ability to leave their property and access the walls? Yes. Well, that's an interesting position. I would think he would have a good argument to say the town has no right to prevent 
the uh, egress, ingress, egress from his property onto Wallace, which has been his right for as long as any of us can remember. But that, that kind of is contradictory to what you just said, because he can do the same thing then. No. Mr. Cumber, I do not understand what you're saying. And I think we're going to bore a lot of people because I don't know how to respond to something that I don't understand. He can shut down that road tomorrow. Where the sidewalk is, he can put a fence across it, right? He can't shut down the public road. I if he so. wants to prevent people from entering into his property, he has a right to do that. Okay. That's the point. We have, when we did the sidewalk, we should continue it straight across. But we chose not to. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else from the public have a question or comment? Seeing none, I will end the public question and comment portion of this meeting for that general part. And agenda item number six, conduct the public hearing. I hereby convene the public hearing for the amendment of the $460,000 school system and capital improvement program phase four ordinance adopted April 27th, 2021 to increase the appropriation of bond authorization by an additional $438,000 for security vestibules at schools within the town. The ordinance, which is the subject of this public hearing, is available to the public and may be obtained at this meeting or from the town clerk. Is there a motion in a second to read the title of the proposed ordinance and waive the reading of the remainder of the ordinance, incorporating its full text into the minutes of this meeting? So moved. Okay. I was going to kill all of you if nobody mentioned that. <laughs> Forever and ever, we would read every single ordinance. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Seeing none, the motion passes. An ordinance amending and an ordinance appropriating $460,000 for school system capital improvement program in phase four and authorizing the issue of $460,000 in bonds of the town to meet said appropriation pending the issuance thereof and making them temporary borrowings for such purpose to increase the appropriation and bond authorization therein by an additional $438,000. Are there any comments from the public? Going once, going twice, seeing none. Is there a motion and a second that the proposed ordinance be adopted from the council? Moved second. Moved and seconded by Councilor Barone and Sandry. Are there any comments, questions, or discussion from the Soviet Council? Councilor Fishman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just procedurally, you know, in the past, we know uh, Mr. Fogby has been here. Uh, not that I have any questions, I'm just trying to figure out if there's somebody here from our bottom council. No one from bottom council here. Excuse me? No one from bottom council here. Is there a reason? Because I, I know that our attorney Fozzi has switched the firms, and I didn't know. You know, I used to always ask, why is the gentleman here? You know, we're afraid to be. Or you say, well, as we always do, so now the gentleman's not here. So we're still using attorney Fozzi. I think it, this is just amending previous ordinance. We're going to be issuing additional bonds. In order to meet this ordinance, correct? Correct. So no bonds have been issued yet. Understood. And that's usually the case that we have. And I'm just trying to figure out somebody, was there a change in philosophy or <coughs> trying to figure out why? I don't think there's any change in philosophy, Mr. Fazzi. Attorney Fazzi is in the process of, of uh, ceasing his activities as bond counsel, and uh, I don't think. Here. Okay, so if he's not available, that's certainly acceptable. That was the board. So that's all I wanted to inquire about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the council? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Harvey? Yes. Fishman? Yes. Patton? Yes. yes. Maroon? Yes. Anna? Yes. 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 The ordinance is adopted. Thank you.
We'll now conduct a public hearing, consider an act on an amendment to the ordinances for salon and personal service establishments. I hereby convene the public hearing for the amendment of the salon of Chapter 173, Salon and Personal Service Establishments of the Code. Is there a motion and a second to read the title of the proposed ordinance and to waive the reading of the remainder of the ordinance, incorporating its full text into the minutes of this meeting? So moved. So moved and seconded by Councilors Testa and Moreau. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Seeing none, the motion passes. The ordinance amending Chapter 173, Salon and Personnel Service Establishments of the Code. Are there any questions from the public? Once, twice, three times. Seeing none, I declare the public hearing closed. Is there a motion and second on the proposed ordinance to be adopted? So moved. Second. So moved by Testa, seconded by Marone. Any questions or comments by the council? Councilor Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to make note um, that with this change, uh, we did slight, very slightly, but we did lower the um, fee to most of the businesses. Um, and I think. You know, during Gordon's meeting, we discussed how we just felt it was a slight, a little something that we could do, uh, you know, piece of the businesses being for the pandemic. So I just wanted to, to make note of that. I don't want to miss the uh, Gordon's committee meeting on this. Thank you. Councilor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just had a question for the candidates. In this, in 173 seven, uh, it's an area that I know we modified, but it's included here just for my education. I'm looking at section C um, about suspending without warning prior notice or hearing of the license. Do we provide? I didn't see it here. Uh, once that suspension happens on an emergency basis. For a hearing process thereafter. We didn't to touch that section, so I don't think we did. Yeah, no, I understood. And I think the purpose of that section is that it's an imminent uh, hazard, which is why it's all. Well, the things that we are talking about are perhaps implicated in number two. So if you look at E, it talks about, so immediately thereafter, you issue the cease and desist, and LEAs is here to... Perhaps, so if there is an eminent health concern and we close them on site because of that eminent concern, they have the opportunity to come forward and present as to why they should be re reopened and that the um, violation has been corrected. On the next page, station F is the appeal. I'm just checking the direction. It's just great. Thank you. We need to pull them back. I meant to go over. No, I just don't know. I'm not sure. 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 You know, a lot, a lot of times with, with you know, fee, you know, we talk about how we tax people and then when we're not taxing there's, there's fees or permit schedules and permit schedules and there are other costs to businesses, but um, we, we did discuss it, she's absolutely correct, we had an opportunity to, uh, we were discussing changes to actually go from $50 to $100, and I believe the state ceiling was two fifty, and a lot of the different, um, Establishments were, were getting, um, they were being assessed for different things. Like if they did hair and nails and, and multiple potential for multiple fees. And when we when we discussed this with the department, we found that it, it wasn't this major revenue stream that the town was getting when we were offsetting a bunch of costs in the in the in the department. There's, there's definitely a lot of footwork for the inspections, and when when there's a return inspection or return effort. Uh, because of the fines they get built in, and that's when someone's out of compliance and not willing to work along to get things straightened out, those start to cover those costs. But 
I, I, I did want to emphasize on, on what she started to bring up because it was an opportunity for us to say, hey, look, we're, we're looking at cost impact, and we didn't need to do this. We didn't need to raise this amount. So we, we kept the original amount, and we instead of bringing it up to 100, we lowered everything else to 50. So um, I, I want to communicate that because a lot of times that you know, we sit up here, the, 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 the taxpayers, they, they don't have a clear understanding of some of the things to get at you, and the business owners don't either. They don't understand why the change in the fees, why it would suddenly go from 50 to 100, that doubles my cost. And I just wanted to bring out that we had an opportunity to hold that in place, and, and we did that because it was, it was important to us, even if it was something small, to, to take that effort to try to offset that, that burden on, on our small businesses. And I really just wanted to kind of accent that a little bit more. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, if, I, if I can comment on that. Please. So I just wanted to give some rationale as to why the fees were raised to 100. The initial ordinance was established in 2013, and the fees were set at that time. They hadn't been increased since then. But our real uh, looking at it are adjoining towns as to what they are charging for licensing of their establishments. Wallingford is, even, even at the $100, is the lowest in all surrounding towns, to give you an understanding. Chestercott, which is, includes Cheshire, our neighbor, is $225 per facility. Quinnipiac Valley, which is North Haven, and Hampton is $145. Um, Middletown is $100. And then um, Meriden is $100. And East Shore, which is also within our region, is $125 or $150. And as we're out there doing our inspections, we um, a lot of times get approached by the property owner or the business owner asking us if we can do a moratorium on salons in our towns or on nail facilities because there's too many for, the, for them to support in this town. They feel like their uh, clients are being torn and going somewhere else because now they have so many options. So our rationale behind raising it to $100 flat fee was uh, trying to put us more in line with our adjoining towns so that perhaps um, some of the competition would be, um, be stopped. And, and if I may, and, and I appreciate I appreciate the, the thought process, and I don't I don't mean to suggest that you know, we were doing something bad here, so please, so please, please don't take it that way. And that is an added element which I don't think was discussed that evening. It might have been, but I and and while I can kind of see the argument for gee, there's a lot of them, so you almost would assume that if if there are more and more coming, that it can't simply just be the lower fee. There's got to be enough customers to support them, and I, and I, I, I want. To, I'll take the opportunity to ask. So, as as these existing businesses approach you with that kind of a mindset and say, "Gee, there's another one that popped open," is is it safe to assume that the, uh, the is the supply outstripping demand? I guess is the question I'm asking. So uh, I really can't answer that because I'm not in the business position. So. Um, I have heard in the past business owners talking about the loss of revenue because there are so many in the town now that are open. But I personally can't speak to what their loss of revenue is or how many the town can support. That was part of our rationale for increasing the fee. But I, I, I share that. I'm sensitive to, to their comments about that, but I, I really think it gets to be a dangerous place where at any municipality says, well, well, we'll start to marginalize how many more people by just raising, raising the amount of fees and taxes. That'll keep a few of them out. I, we, we should be encouraging more businesses. And, and, and on top of that, I, I would hope that, you know, we, we've got different organizations in the town, WCI and, and other, other entities that are supposed to be there to help these small businesses. And I would encourage them even that if they are struggling in the face of competition, that they might might reach out to these different organizations that we have and say, look, there's suddenly a lot of nail salons, there's suddenly a lot of barbers. How do I differentiate myself? What do you want or what can I do? Because I don't think raising the fees is right. It's all logically the way you described it with other towns were very low, but I want to encourage that for our town. I want the businesses to come and establish. Now, I would almost argue that at a saturation point, 
is, is the consumer decides that. Because if there's enough consumers to keep all these businesses afloat, then they'll all stay afloat. If competition starts to close a couple of them, then there's not enough demand. But I, I'm real weary to say, well, we'll raise our rates and maybe a few less and we'll open. I, I don't want to see us doing that. But I, I, I think the sentiment of comparing our rates as opposed to neighbors was a very good one. But I, I still appreciate the decision that, that we arrived at by trying to keep the fees low. I'm sorry, Brian. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Ms. Hazel, well, thank you for, for being here. Just so you get some of the background. So I had suggested that the change for the fees. Um, and my comments were along the lines, usually when government charges a fee for something, it's sort of intended as a barrier to entry, right? To, to prevent other businesses from getting into that space. And your comments about you being asked about it sort of speaks to that idea. Um, but you know, the, the department's about health, right? And so I want you to do what you can to serve the public health, the proper inspections, and so on. So to not necessarily connect the fee, you know, what, it costs to run the department, the fees bring in such a small amount. So my rationale was that you know if you charge a dollar or you charge a thousand dollars, it's not really going to change the efficacy of your ability to conduct your inspections and so on. So if you disconnect the actual inspection, the cost of what is to run the department from the, the actual you know, fee that you charge for business, at that point it becomes just sort of a you know a whole point. So we look at things like what do other towns charge, which is not an unfair comparison, right? But I think that the goal of the committee at that point was just to, you know, what we talk, spent a lot of time in ARPA talking about how to help business and how do we help business, you know, in this regard. Can we do a little bit more? It's certainly not a lot of money, but, you know, it's not really a lot of money on either side. So, I, I mean, I guess if I had my brothers, we wouldn't charge anything, but I realized that, you know, in you know, 2022, that's sort of an unrealistic expectation. So I'm, that's why um, we sort of went in the direction we did. For, no, I totally understand. I just wanted to share more of that. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate your work. Any other questions, comments from council? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Harmony? Yes. Fishman? Yes. Lathan? Yes. Ramon? Yes. Tana? Yes. Testa? Yes. Sandy? Yes. Motion passes. The ordinance has been adopted. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody that worked on that. Agenda item, agenda item number eight. I have a motion to approve to approve resolution authorizing Mayor William Double William Dickinson to file an application for the State of Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development (DECD) Connecticut Communities Challenge Grant for a three million dollar project for the rehabilitation of the exterior and interior of the town's historic railroad station building. To provide such additional information to execute other such other documents as may be required to execute an assistance agreement with the state of Connecticut DECD for financial assistance if offered to execute any amendments, decisions, and revisions thereto to carry out code activities and to act as the authorized representative of the town of Wallingford. So moved. So moved by Councillor Sandry. Is there a second? Seconded by Council Marone. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, uh, name and title to the mic. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, Anthony Bergali, UBC uh, alternate. Okay, and Bill Silver, president of Silver Country Selling and Associates, architects, engineers, and interior designer. With the app in my hand. Great, thank you. We have two. Do you have a presentation you want to give? Start with, or you want to start with questions? Uh, I was going to start by reading a, uh, a statement. Um, I'm standing in. Uh, Any more microphone, in. please? Microphone? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I don't know, talk. All right. Uh, I'm standing in this evening for Joe Mirror without a town. Really? And being witness of the DTC. It's okay. I have a member of the DTC. Four years uh, now, I volunteer my time to eat and see good to live, work, and embrace my family in this community. It's my home, and like everyone in there, my life is now. My goal today is to provide an executive summary on the project to restore the historic volume of railroad station. The gentleman with me will uh, detail the specifics of the project uh, to date, the next steps, and the process, and the support it will require from the town council. What 
I hope the community gain is why we feel this is a good move for our community and the economic vibrancy of the surrounding area. Like everything, there is a cost for rehabilitating the railroad station into something business ready, whether it's a restaurant or retail store or both. This is a town asset that uh, there was an opportunity for challenge grant that would match 50% of the funding to make this project a reality. This is a town asset that will need repairs and upgrades regardless of this project. We can have this opportunity now with the challenge grant uh, it can help create something special in the town center that will have a deep and uh, lasting impact. Our town center is often thought of in two sections, upper and lower center street. The upper section uh, crossing Main Street is a vibrant and active area with great restaurants and retail shops and is home to much of our community activity. In recent years, there has been a host of improvements to this area. So the, park, the parking alone makes it uh, more inviting than historic buildings have continued to be renovated. The upper section of the town has its own rhythm parking there all the time. Um, and there's a lower section of Center Street, great talk. Actually, Paul Avenue it too has its own feel and rhythm. This whole area has recently gone up, undergone uh, massive improvements uh, that is for uh, economic growth and development. The new Rivas Plaza, the new parking lot being constructed in the former Brothers uh, restaurant that does not have a foundation in it. The beautiful uh, new train station, park and place, the area is still undergoing great transformation um, and it's becoming even more of a destination. Uh, the restoration of the historic railroad station will become the anchor that connects upper and lower sections of uh, Wallingford Town Center and help every business uh, in between them and in the surrounding area. It's a vibrant, walkable town center, accessible by foot, bus, and train. The renovated train station in and of, in and of itself um, will become a billboard to people drive by, people on the train. Uh, it's, it's kind of the gateway to our community. Um, Town Center, uh, as most residents know, is just the tip of the iceberg of what our town has to offer. This project, uh, this area, is at the center of all and in the heart of our community, uh, and will become a major hub of activity, producing favorable economic impact to the community for many years to come. And Mr. Chairman, I may Bill Silver, Bill Silver, Patrick Silver, a registered historic architect in our group as well. Many of you know Dave Stein, and I was rushing to be here right now as we speak. Um, it, you obviously know 1871, this is a second empire building, and it is unique in the state, and it deserves every effort to be restored or maintained. Um, obviously, you know it's unique pictures because you've spent money in the past to preserve it. So the existing photographs, obviously, from the 40s and the 30s, so without comment, there hasn't been really much that has changed on the exterior of the building, which means you've been good stewards of the historic character of the building. On the left, it means the floor plan. Uh, I don't know if I'm standing in the way. The floor plan of the existing plan in 1973, the L students reconfigured the interior of the space and eventually became the adult education space. So it's really configured well for offices, but again, it's public use as opposed to uh, you know, tenant use and tax paying use that it could uh, see in its future. So we uh, obviously documented all the existing conditions as part of the building uh, to prepare it for the idea session that we worked with the committee. Um, certainly, this board represented the briefly touch on the exterior restoration elements that we strongly encourage. Many of these, uh, for instance, the state building precedes 1973. That's over 50 years of life on some fairly, fairly thin slate and it has done well in its life. It also has a stainless steel roof on the top that you can't see. But all of all the ridges that you can see that dates from 1991. That's 30 years, which is a good life. Standing the roof, and it's time to maintain it. So, what we have proposed as part of our package here, as part of that three million, is the exterior restoration, which is truly stabilizing the exterior of the building. Uh, 
because it's on the National Register in 1993, uh, there is very little that should be changed on its exterior appearance. And even if we were to mention it in that direction, the State Historic Preservation Office would slap our hands and say, no, you don't. And so therefore, we're replacing the standing cement roof, repairing where we can the slate roof, because old slate doesn't really get much older. It is centuries old when we're in a short lifespan, so there's no reason not to maintain uh, some of those uh, slate roofs. The exterior uh, has been weather beaten, especially in the lower reaches, because of its adjacency to the road and the salt bearing trucks that we allow to transverse across it. And so the groundstone and the brick on the lower reaches are stalling a bit, and they do need to be replaced or restored with uh, some type of materials. On the interior, as part of the proposal to you, we are simplifying the layout um, by creating an upstairs tenant space with a new elevator, a uh, new restroom, so that there could be an independent second floor tenant that looks down below into one larger tenant space that again has the lift in the restrooms, the entrances are maintained the same, possibly a, a proposed kitchen for, let's say, a restaurant use could be repurposed as part of the existing space. And again, not adding on, preserving what is existing as well as restoring or repairing the elements of the building, which includes windows, and especially the exterior doors that 30 years of being manipulated constantly, uh, we should live so long after 30 years of the beast that it has. So those are some of the features that we are proposing the commissioners to post as part of this project. Um, the, uh, there is, if you care that I continue to limit one, Bob, one. If you can limit with all your wonderful statements and other questions that come Everybody else, that'd be great. Okay. So, yes, keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, we have budgeted, and you've seen the spreadsheets, roughly um, $860,000 for the next year's stabilization and restoration of the, of the existing materials. We can't change materials. So, once the MEC was on there, we can't go to uh, the shingles because the state would have a mess. Um, so, Preservation truly means authenticity. Um, the interior improvements, which includes the structural changes, the stair towers, the life safety for the future tenant uses, the restrooms, is another six hundred and fifty thousand. And then the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection changes. Not so much improvements. It would be delivered in the air condition and air handling to adequately ventilate it to current code standards. Um, but we wouldn't be putting in all the finishes and all the uh, diffusers and the finishing touches until the tenant comes in to do those connections and make those kind of connections. So essentially we are preparing the shell for the future tenant uses, which the commission has been looking at. Uh, various examples of repurposing train stations for, uh, for whatever use to make come its way. And with that, I'll stop and turn back to you. Great. Thank you. Councilor Fishman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, welcome to Mr. Crowley. I appreciate you being here. And uh, to meet the uh, main partner of Silver Bank of Sally, uh, I tell you that Mr. Stein has always represented your company very valuably in the future tonight. You know, we've heard a lot about uh, singular tenant here. And, you know, recently I was at a um, establishment in Hartford that they had taken a warehouse and they had converted it into something like um, Chelsea Market or um, uh, the place uh, in, um, in Boston. Um, I think my name is Daniel Hall. Daniel Hall, that's right. Um, has there been this, we, to my knowledge, we've been part of these discussions, you know, sort of my vision is to have someone like um, maybe WCI or something like set up uh, booths in this building um, and you know rent out space for many different restaurants and you know, shops and that kind of stuff. Given your design, which understand 
my understanding, he was basically an open floor plan. Would he still have that flexibility to do something like that? Yes, absolutely. Many needs of egress and entry, uh, not only for safety, but the convenience of the customers. Um, we're calculated as part of that core space that's created there. So you can go left to right, up and down. So there's a multitude of tenants that can be in the building that don't disturb the other tenants. Okay, yeah, that's because I, I kept on hearing about tenant in the singular, and you know, I just want to be part of that, that discussion. So, you know, I, I like what I see and I like what I've heard, and uh, that's all I wanted to ask about once again. Thank you for coming here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll start that. Thank you, Mr. Shannon. Um, thank you. So, my questions are uh, on the same topic. So, to me, it looks like it's a little too specific on the interior. Um, you know, I noticed when I read the little back up, it sounds like it's being designed for two tenants, which was sort of what it was leaning towards. Um, and I'm just wondering why you're doing so much work to the interior before we know who the tenant might be. So I understand the exterior, I completely understand the code upgrades, um, but the interior work, I'm just a little confused as to why we would have the tenant first, and then we can decide what needs to be done for that specific tenant. I would hate for us to spend money doing interior um, upgrades and design, and then we get a tenant who says, I want the entire thing, or um, maybe we get more tenants than we thought we would get. So can you just explain why the interior uh, design? Yeah, the core, the core spaces uh, are essentially designed for any user, whether it's retail, whether it's restaurant. Everyone needs restrooms, everyone needs stairs or lifts for not only ADA accessibility, but for life safety. And so that's why we've located those stairways and the core facilities of the uh, restrooms where they are, centrally located, so that you could, on the lower floor, break it up into two users, or it could be one continuous user across. And of course, the committee commission talked about uh, it'd be great if a restaurant were to go in there. That's a perfect, at the right side, a perfect place for a kitchen to be located with service entries and stuff, and, and like, uh, like that. Ideally, even if it's one user, the convenience for the lift requirement, whether it's a retail or office, you do have to provide accessibility as much as you can, but also restrooms. It's obviously much more convenient to have them on the second floor and just not locate them on the first floor. So we try to be as central as possible, and probably before we actually we finished the construction documents, hopefully we will have made progress with potential tenants and ideas so that we can tailor a bit of the design uh, just to be more flexible and with your input, we're flexible to other ideas. So we don't have them all, but this was kind of the core the services that serve any tenant. Okay, so this is flexible still at this point. So if, if as this goes on, let's say we're working around and then we realize that there's one large tenant and they say, we don't want the bathrooms in the middle, we really rather they go over here. That we still have the flexibility to do that. Yes. Perfect. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Landry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So and, uh, I, have to, I have to say, it's probably been 40 years since I've been inside that building. As, as a youth, we used to gather on Saturdays and uh, uh, do, do, do different things there as, as different groups. And so, my memory is admittedly very, very fuzzy. Even with the, the pictures are great, and I appreciate the pictures, but it's well changed from when we used to use it um, when I was a teenager. So, I, I recall your drawings show a, a first floor plan and a second. Now, wasn't there also a mezzanine area that went up even higher, like almost like a like a third level up inside that building? If it was, it was just a service mezzanine and not fully a people space. Okay. And of course, there is the basement for the monitor. So that was my next question, the basement area. Are we going to be utilizing that at all as part of any type of design? Or if, if like the example with, with the restaurant, they might use it for dry goods or you know, takeout items, or would they be able to get into that space as well? I believe it is primarily the microphone. I believe it's primarily so it's almost all like utilities pipes and hot water heaters and things of that nature. Okay. Um, 
Another another question that I have is you know, kind of on the outline here, and, and kind of kind of dovetails off the questions that were already asked. So we're doing these these core types of setups with this plan, in other words, like um, with with the boilers and the um, and not the, the the water systems, which are designed just to basically be the way they are, bring them up to code. So if if a tenant wanted to come in, whatever that tenant might need to do, if they needed a bigger boiler for hot water, is that a cost that we would assume that they would take on and add in for the customization of the area, or is that something as part of the effort that we're doing here? No, that would be it's one of the last line items in the estimate, which is the developer put it on allowance at the very bottom of the foot of grade total. There would be that allowance that the developer would have to extend to customize even the mains, for instance, the IP systems, uh, the boilers really shouldn't be. They're sized for the volume of the space and the occupancy. But even duct systems, maybe trunks, maybe trunks would be extended into simply uh, logically located mains for ventilation, but then they would extend um, the flex ducts to the diffusers. That would be a developer or a tenant at our cost. Okay. And and maybe this is more of an EDC question, but as you know, we have to we have to do some level of work here anyway because the station needs tending to. I mean, it, it's needs repairs, it needs upgrades, it needs fixing, and we know we have we have adult dead in there presently. So, I in various discussions you've had with other people that are looking from the town and looking for space, has the, the idea of possibly utilizing the space been floated just hey. In the future, we might be looking to do something with this area. I, I believe our former EDC here had had some conversations with people expressed some interest, but I don't think anything very solid. I think there's a way to see what the space looks like, and um, you know, our opinion, I think, is that it's not going to be a the space itself. Yeah, that was that was actually going to be like my add-on to that. So it's it's definitely you know. Obviously, once you're inside a building, you can do a lot of things to it. Um, and, and the only, it's not even a reservation, it's just the thing that people have to overcome is that basically they're going to be parking in that parking lot and walking over the sidewalks, which, you know, the train tracks are but it's a sidewalk. People, dozens of people do it every single day. I do it when I walk through. So th those tiny little negative elements you feel like are like a complete non issue. Right? I don't think so. It's, it's a marquee building. You know, it's, it'll be the center of the area, you know, depending on what goes in there, like I said, either a restaurant, coffee shop, retail shop, uh, it's a prime location, so I don't think it'll be our space for rent. And, and is, the, is, the town, is the town flexible on what we can put in there? The reason that I ask this question is that I know that with you know, bars and restaurants, and you know, there's always that concern that you, there's another one going downtown, but I, I've seen former buildings converted into of the, the microbreweries, and they have a fantastic area. I mean, there's a gathering area, they've got the, the beer on tap, they have you know, guest wines in the house, and then there's a, not even just like little conference areas, but they've got games, and you don't know that whole floor plan, there's a lot of space there. And I think that, especially if it's open enough, there's one place that I visited, they had small food, because there's a food element you have to have when you're selling alcohol, but they would, because of the way that the area was almost like um, leased off, like it was a pizza place and a sandwich guy, they, they had adjacent spaces, but it was almost like they brought in a food truck, but people could also bring food in. So that, that brought up the business for all the restaurants in the area because people would bring in. Do we, do we believe that the town has got enough flexibility between the health department and the codes that we might be able to attract a customer like that or a tenant? I would, I would ask you to check with Joe Mira uh, on that. I think I don't want to answer for him, but uh, my, my guess would be yes. I think if we do this right and build the proper space, you know, we'll have multiple people to choose from and decide what we really want to put in there. That's going to be best for the town. That, that's great. It's great to hear because, again, I, I feel that, to your point, this is like a magnet that will bring people will come because it'll be new, it'll be fresh, but I, I really think that it could be an add-on to the whole area because, you know, in you know, based on whatever goes in there, if people are coming down for music or if people are coming down for coffee or whatever ends up going in there, 
They're able to bring up things that will stop up the street, carry something in, that will get their coffee, sit at the table. Like I said, but there's like you know, a little area for music. I, I, I think this has uh, a lot of positives, and, and to me, there's almost zero negative because we got to put some money into this anyway. So I, I appreciate the outline um, and, and, and the cost breakdown is really good. It's very simple to see where everything's going to go. So I appreciate all the time and effort on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Sandra, Councilor Tessa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate the presentation. I'll work on this. Um, I was working on this. Just some overall questions. I, far be it for me to ever suggest the town of Russia on anything, but um, we, we find ourselves in a situation where we, we are contemplating this. And on board, but I have a lot of good ideas on my own. We're also faced short, we will be faced with decisions about the armory of the police station. So um, it's very important to me that when we're making these decisions, we're doing them as part of a comprehensive look at the whole industry. Because we certainly have primary concern about, for example, what to do with adult education. The faster we go with the train station, the faster they got to move out. Um, if, in fact, it is their desire and it proves prudent that the Board of Ed potentially take over that armory building, then what a great idea to get about that and go into there. Um, worst case scenario, maybe that, that takes a little while and they're forced to find a temporary space for about that and they get into I, that would be ideal. And if it was a one year delay and you know, all of this come together, that's one of those situations where I would say let's take it slow and make a better decision comprehensively. Um, anyway, so I'm concerned about the time frame, but I, I like where we're going so far. I might, as I was reading this stuff, I was thinking, and I think I'm not alone, I think that those on the council might be thinking, is there already a plan in mind that somebody has? And are we kind of pursuing that? And I read the, the ideas for what an RFP would be, uh, how an RFP would be proposed. Um, and that, at the very least, seems to indicate we're looking, we would be looking um, for a developer to come in, lease them the building for 10 years, and let them decide what to do. I'm assuming we wouldn't accept an RFP for that if we didn't approve the use. Um, so I like hearing that uh, you're all open to suggestions on what final use might be. Uh, I don't want to see us rushing into an RFP for something and being forced to make a decision uh, that might have implications for the Board of Ed, etc. other types of things. Uh, before I forget, you know, someone asked about the basement. Um, and the model railroad folks are still are down there right now, right? And is there any additional room? Or they pretty much take up the basement? They take up a good half of the basement. A good half of the basement? Yes, the other half is utility space. Oh, it's a really usable space. <laughs> They're usually the usable space. Yes, and you can argue it's the only usable, how full it is. Um, I hope to say this is a rare moment, I believe, when um, my colleague, Councilor Fishbein, and I share a vision. Um, he didn't say anything about dragging our feet, though. Oh, no, I'm just saying. No, I, I said it because I actually, I had written something publicly about two weeks ago uh, suggesting pretty much very, very, a lot very similar to what Councilor Fishbein suggested, um, in, in that this space could be a, a sort of a central marketplace draw for the community. Um, and in doing so, we might even be able to still allow the model railroad to stay down in the basement as part of a historical uh, nod of the hat to the station and you know so forth. And, and then in those discussions, someone brought up to me, gosh, I know the Board of Ed probably needs um, 
somewhere for their transition program. And I was thinking, I don't know what that entails, so I'm not going to speak for them, but I, I thought to myself, wow, if the town utilized this space as it a sort of a market type, multi, multi-purpose, year-round garden market slash kiosks for all sorts of things, depending on how much space the transition program needed, they, they could possibly be looking at different money. What an interesting career opportunity for our uh, the kids that come out of high school and are, are in that transition program move into meaningful employment. And I mean, just the opportunities are endless. So by, by and so bringing all that up, I'm not saying that's where we go, but I want us making that decision. I mean, you know, in a very big way. I want this group here with the community involved, be involved in what happens with this building. Um, I just I don't want a, a small group to jump ahead a little bit and then we're all accepting and adjusting at that point. So my wish is that we are involved throughout the whole process with what uses could be uh, this building could have. Um, the uses I'm talking about might even not require us to lease it to anyone. Um, you fix it up and we might end up in our, you might be simply for a uh, early manager to oversight. And maybe we could evolve the program from the board of it. Or maybe not. Even that's fine in the sky. I don't know. We need too much space. But uh, I don't want to jump the gun. I love where we are right now. Um, I, I, sir, I really respect your clear love for the historic, your love for the historical side of this. I have no question that. You know, that's going to be taken care of. And uh, I just want to make sure we're involved in all this. Um, that's it for now. Oh, so the grant, we're going to seek the grant. That would come before a bid, an RFP, correct? I mean, by accepting this, you can go out with a bid. I love it. the grant. But is there going to be a time frame once we get the grant where we have to do something? And that might force an RFP sooner than we want it. Well, first, the first thing will be to receive the grant. If you don't receive the grant, that's $1.75 million you won't have. So that's probably going back to the drawing board. So it's getting the grant. The purpose tonight is to apply for the grant. Right. Once we have the grant, then decisions will be turned to RFP and those other issues. Forest and move ahead. Basically, I'm to the grant. How much time do we have to spend that money? I don't know if there's a time frame on the grant. I don't think there is. Oh, so, so we, we, we would want to move ahead as soon as possible. I mean, we don't want to wait a year before we make decisions. Looking to make decisions in, in months, very months after we see the grant. Why? Well, we, we need to move forward with our. What does that mean? We would, we would, we would in, certainly look to move ahead with the construction issues, That's one issue, and then the other issue is. Uh, is completed, uh, are we going to hire a developer or not? Mm -hmm. the RFP. So, what kind of time frame would that be? For example, you receive the grant, you move ahead with all of the repair work, the renovation work. Give me a, a rough time frame. I, I, I would tend to say three months would be up to bid, at least on a portion, depending on the time of the grant. <laughs> um, and certainly the signing of the grant, that can take as long as you go through the Legal process, mm -hmm. uh, but give it about three months after we're going to go. We can be uh, certainly for the exterior restoration part, which is a specialty in itself, um, and pause on the interior work so that an RFP could be issued for interior development for interior tenants. Then we customize the interior core facilities to that tenant need. Perfect. 
to coordinate with the natural user that's under contract. But it just requires timing. So there are many different ways of phasing this. But to answer your question, three months to get out the bid for the exterior of the building, probably a good six months to have it completed. We're about a year old, realistically. And everybody that talks about construction projects, all we hear about is, oh, they're going to take forever. They're going to take forever because look where things are going right now. We're going to get a year out, and we can still be making decisions in nine months to a year from now about what we want to do with the building. Um, that's reasonable, right? And just keep in mind, these are all estimates. So they're right, the decision making at the point, bid prices have to be Oh, I know. Uh, as, far as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, and again, I don't like to see delay for delay purposes, but the longer we wait, the cheaper we should get. It's pretty clear. Oh, oh come on. Uh, eventually, construction is going to get a little cheaper, but that's another story. Uh, but no, I know it's an estimate. I just, as I said, I don't want to see a rush. I'm, I'm rambling now. I don't want to see a rush to anything. So if we let you go forward with what you're proposing for the exterior, we get the grant, we give ourselves time. Give this a lot of thought, nine months to a year out, then we have a better idea where are we with the army, what's the timing on the lease project, and we can only make these decisions in conjunction with, with the board of ed, and, and you know, we're not, we're not um, putting handcuffs on ourselves about what our options are. So, uh, I appreciate all your time. I like where we're going. Thank you very much. I think this is a great idea. I'm all in favor of the grant. I think the time frame for all of this, I mean, it's going to be a real long path. Once this kicks off, Say as soon we get the grant and construction starts, you're going to see a lot of interest and in, in, in opportunity. Just, you know, people will want to commit to the building. All of your thoughts and ideas, you know, you're going to have a lot, a lot to choose from. Well, no question. And, and I think it's, it's safe to say, you know, tomorrow you'll have somebody here saying, I want to put in a brewery. Uh, there's going to be no shortage of single tenant users that are going to want it. The question is, is that going to be the best decision for us as a community, as a whole? Because we want to, we want to revitalize that whole downtown area. And I don't care what you say, a multi-use, potential multi-use multi draw, um, year on, rather than a one single use, I think could you know, be more productive using the property. That's why I want to keep it as an option to us. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Tessa, Councillor Tata, and Councillor Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in that same regard, does the EC already have a tenant in mind? No. Okay. Um, and so then, I guess my question then is how do you get a tenant, which seems like it would be through the RFP process, correct? That's the plan. And then who, who will be writing the RFP? Like, basically, who decides what? You know, what the qualifications are, what we, what we want to come in here. We, as architects and engineers, we help at least write it from the technical side and what their expectations would be. Uh, but certainly, in terms of the use uh, criteria, I, I think that would really come from uh, the City Hall side, certainly from the Economic Development Commission, through all the your input about what are preferable uses and how we'll be expressing those in those. Um, it, it tends to be non-technical language uh, in the RFP for the uses, but the demands that we put in there for the submission are quite robust in terms of improving the viability of their concept. And then, who ultimately decides that who is awarded the RFP? It all comes back to the council. So, the discussion about the development of the RFP, the council would be involved in that. Because it's, it's a little different than a normal RFP, because you're really, in this one, you're selling the town, right? You're, you're saying, hey, developers or whatever, come to us. This is what. So, it's going to be a bit more elaborate in terms of the sales pitch than a normal RFP would be. So, you know, you'll be involved in that process. You'll be Ultimately, the decision is going to end up being here because obviously you're spending the money on it. So, you know, I think that's, I mean, the goal is thinking that there might be a developer as opposed to, you know, doing a deal with five different tenants, for example. So, you know, the thinking is that there would be a developer who would be interested in the project, RFPs would come in, and then the whole 
would be part of the review of those RFPs and the decision making. But, you know, like I said, it's a little bit different than a normal RFP because we're saying, you know, you need to come in and invest in us. We're, going, we're doing this investment. We want to be your partner. Um, let's do this deal. So it's a little different, but it'll be exactly the same problem. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I guess I just want to make sure that um, the RFP is the way it's written and ultimately the, the decision. Um, I mean, I think we all have different ideas of what, what we think might be best there. And, just trying to figure out who would ultimately decides what what would work. So it sounds like the council would be ultimately the yeah, it was council definitely. And you know, I mean, initially you're you're saying to developers, tell us, make your pitch, yeah. right? So um, we get a variety of types of proposals, and you know, the, the thing that you may want, maybe they already did that, and he says that's an idea, but or maybe half doesn't do, and you have to pick the right one. So. Okay, great, thank you, and then. As far as the grant money, um, it, so it looks like it's 50 percent actual, and then it says in the backup material that um, we would look to seek that back possibly through negotiations with the developer. Um, but initially, we have to, you know, the town has to fund that money. So where would that portion of the money come from? So it might be about 850,000. So where would we get that money from initially? Well, the, it would be 1.75 million that the town would be responsible for, um, and uh, we would have to appropriate funds in order to do that. So there could be a, a bond authorization or other means of appropriating funds. But, uh, we we have to appropriate uh, the 1.75 million in order to ultimately have 3.5 million. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought 1.75 is the total. Okay, so it's 1.75 is our, it's our portion of the. That's the 50% that we're matching with the state. Understood. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Carney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Um, this is a uh, very exciting project in my mind uh, with a lot of potential. And thank you for all the work that you're putting into it. Um, Investment in our downtown is so important. What can be done here with the train station is, uh, you know, it, the, oper the, the opportunities are endless, and, and I'm very excited um, about what you showed us here tonight and the conversations that will be happening um, in the future. Most of my questions were just answered um, from Councillor um, Testa and Tata's questions about timeline, um, but I just, I guess, I have a few more questions just specifically about the timeline. So we think that we would be awarded the grant in, Jan in January if we do in fact are you know are awarded the grant. Oh uh, we it's total guess. Okay. Total guess it, I believe the time that it was delayed for this to be submitted. Um, the application time was, was lengthened. So now it's uh, in October. Uh, when exactly the state may award it? There's no way to. Okay, so there is no, there's no, there's no information from the DCPS. Yeah. Yes, the only thing I have understanding is it could be in January. But, you know, we, we can't be certain of that until it happens. Okay, so as soon as January, though, I mean that's not that long from now, and then we think that we would go out to get within three months of of that. For a portion, for a portion of the project, yes. And so, I mean, I, I've mentioned this before when, when you've been before us. Um, my biggest concern is the relocation of adult education. You know, um, it, that is such an important program that we offer our residents in, in town. And I know that our Board of Education and, and the superintendents and staff um, are looking at uh, oppor other opportunities for, for the adult that Can you just touch upon that and, and let me know, you know where, where are you looking? What, what other facilities in town are being considered? I mean, where are we in this process? I mean, are we not going to begin this process till January when we're awarded the grant? Or if we're awarded the grant? I can't you know more than chair. Um, obviously, we can't talk about specific buildings that we may have been looking at amongst the community. Um, I would just like to point out in that FAQ, if this grant is awarded, the town has three years to commit the funds and five years to finish the project. 
So I would hope within that timeline, if we were going to move to a town building, such as if the armory fits our needs or, or something, that we would be able to accomplish that. You know, in the event that we have to vacate sooner, um, the superintendent has um, spoken with different potential areas that we, we may, if we have to, that we have to go. So, um, you know, that's something that we, we will cross that bridge if we have to, um, but we're hoping if the grant comes in that everybody will be able to meet the time. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Um, that, that's really my biggest concern. I, of course, will be supporting this tonight, but I, I just want to verbalize the, the, the fact that you know, we, um, we should be taken very seriously, and it sounds like we are, the relocation of adult education. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from council? Uh, before we go to the public, I just want to thank the DC and the firm, sir, and the Board of Education for their flexibility and all this. Um, it's, it's a big project, and we're all in the best we can, so we appreciate the amount of time you're putting into it. Public question and sort of period, Mr. Gross. Because you can get parallel grants besides this grant, you can get parallel grants. You can use money as long as it's not from the state. Um, so there are other funding ways. On here, are you going to put in, and I didn't see the plans, electrical charging stations for cars? Uh, Mr. Chairman, right now, uh, we are just dealing with the core issues. Uh, certainly, the future tenant would uh, uh, dictate the need, either of its clientele or, let's say, of the public if they're at a restaurant, but the need for that, uh, for the charging stations. Certainly, open to it. It is not a large burden, uh, but right now, it is not part of the plan because we're dealing just with the core and the show. The reason I ask is because this is a this grant is one time for you coming in. Why aren't we going big and doing that with the charging stations in the parking lot, which is adjacent to it, and the state can pick up half the cost for? There was talk on the council about having electric car charging stations there. This is a way that the state can pick up 50% of the cost. That has been, in other communities that have received this grant, that's been one of the things that they put in the grant that they have received money for. Because that's one of the things they want this to be as a transit oriented project. And electrified cars is green as far as the state's concerned. So hopefully the EDC can add that in before so it wouldn't cost the town as much. Um, why are we, being the town, doing the interior? I understand the exterior, but why aren't we going out to bid to develop and let them develop the interior? Way they want it, take the tax because it's a historic building, and take the tax credits that the state and the feds provide to renovate the historic building. Wouldn't that be less cost expensive to the state for the town? Typically, a commercial landlord, correct me if I'm wrong, will provide a vanilla shell that then, once the tenant's identified, uh, can be easily modified to just a basic, 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 and that's where we would start. Well, show us the exterior. Yeah, the interior. It's all up. It's a term in the industry. Okay. Why aren't we taking, are we going to take over in the town, take over the basement, or is the model train going to stay there? At this point, there's been no real determination on the basement. I think once we get closer to, uh, we receive the grant, then uh, uh, it's, it's very likely that for one reason or another, we would not want another uh, use in the building, given that uh, the developer potentially would be taking it over, and, and I would think they would have to move. But, um, we need good access to the mechanicals that are in the basement, and anything that confuses the issue of 
of uh, use of the space and uh, security issues as well, I think we would, we would probably want to make the developer really in charge of the entire area. And um, that, would, that would mean that the railroad would have to move on. Would it be, um, just to the point that somebody made, that if we didn't go ahead with this, then we'd be on the hook for $1.16 million to develop. The exterior, that's the cost. Other towns have done the same thing, but they want the brands in the town. Because it's a historic building, the state will pay for 50% of the renovations of the exterior. I say Windsor Locks did it recently, their train station that way, and then developed it into, went out to a contractor, and they developed the interior for restaurants, etc. Their only expense was half the exterior, and everything else was the interior. It's just, what happens if you have a cost of 3.5 million, approximately? That's the number you're going to the state for. State grants the 1.75 million to half the grant. What happens by the time it's done? And I agree with Mr. Tesla, though, I think costs will come down in time. But if they don't, and it's overrun, we're on the hook for 100% of the cost, we can we go back to the state. Anyway? I don't think there's any, any assurance that you can go back to the state. Uh, I suppose you could make an effort to apply for a different grant. If you may get it, you may not. It would be a decision at the time, and grants are available. So there will be all of them. So maybe we'll talk about this. Any other comments, questions from the public, Mr. Ross? Ray Russell, Prime Departments. I'm hearing a lot of talk that this is an historic building. Does anybody know? Is it at the National Register? Yes, it is, 1993. Okay. And I have a real concern, and it's on the National Register. They don't allow modifications to the exterior of the building. We can do what we want inside. But if we want a restaurant in there, and if you think the National Register is going to approve this great big uh, stainless steel vent on the outside of the building, we have, we have another thought coming. So I would just be concerned about that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. A response to that, or if you're just smiling. Yes, all, all our hands are collectively tied by the National Register and the standards to maintain the exterior of the materials and image. So we will not see masses of lots of aluminum coming in with the new restaurant. So there will not be a giant here. The next developer has to accept the exterior as it is. Any other questions or comments? I have a question. Why are we doing this? I'd like to know the ultimate goal, not the immediate goal of having this great looking entity downtown, but since I've been involved for so many years and concerned for so many years with the vibrancy of the downtown as a whole, and I worked with Linda Bush and I worked with Casey, and their primary goal was to get permanent residents downtown. That is the primary goal if you want a successful downtown. I worked very closely with Smithcraft, and they were looking at the Wooden Capital Park. They also looked at the Silversmith Park as me. Folks did not want to sell it. But their primary philosophy is you bring in permanent residents, not people who are going to come on a Friday night and then go home to North Haven or Meriden or wherever they come from, Essex, to come to a particular place. That's not what creates a vibrant, long-lasting, successful downtown. What creates a long-lasting, vibrant, successful downtown is a lot of permanent residents downtown who frequent the same places over and over again. And as the fellow from Smithcraft said, they will determine their needs. They will determine what kind of businesses have to come into that downtown based on the things they want. The mayor of Milford said Milford was dying 
In spite of all its restaurants, its boutiques, its clubs, its this and that, until Smithcraft came in, purchased a whole bunch of properties, and renovated them to single and double tenant properties. Once they brought in these professional people who were coming from out of town, getting off at the train station in Milford, everything boomed in Milford. Because now there was a population that wanted to use the facilities that were there. We're talking about building an entity, a singular entity, that might look great, bring people in on a weekend or once in a while or twice a month, but how does that contribute to the sustainability of a downtown that has a built-in clientele? This sounds like a shot in the dark. I want somebody to tell me, we earn the immediate, get a successful tenant, get a successful restaurant tour. Nobody's going to come in and buy a property in Wallingford because there's a great restaurant downtown, especially in the center of the downtown. How does this work toward that ultimate goal that Linda worked for, that Casey worked for, that the Wooden Capital Committee tried to work for? How does that bring you to that further entity other than an immediate gratification? She would got a great thing out of town. And how do you even know it's going to be sustainable? So I don't know how we got to here without looking at here. A, a business, a town, which is a business, always says, where am I going with this project? Where will it bring me 20 years from now, 25 years from now? In my opinion, the money that the town is going to have to spend one way or another to maintain and revitalize this business should be used to purchase properties now. That can then be sold because we own it, and that's the only way the incentive housing program is going to work. We now own it. Now we sell it to a developer, and he puts in 50 units. Those permanent tenants will now determine the kinds of businesses they want downtown. Their living there will determine the needs and will therefore say to the people going, well, We need this. We need, I don't know what it could be. We need another restaurant or bar. And yeah, will they say that? Yeah, I don't know. But whatever they're going to, they're, they're just as in Milford, it was the permanent population that came into Milford because of the work done by Smithcraft that, as the mayor said, revitalized all of downtown Milford. Here, this to me is a one shot, high in the sky, total waste of money. We should be looking 20 years from now, 25 years from now. Not next year, we're talking about it's going to happen next year. It could happen next year, but it could be done the year after that. You've got to start looking further ahead to say, what do we want to create down here that will bring in businesses? And you're not doing that. You're saying, well, this business will bring in people. Wrong. People bring in businesses. If you're going to be happy to have a few clientele go downtown once or twice a week, to a restaurant, have a couple of beers or whatever. That's just so short-sighted. And, and that's why I'm wondering why you're putting so much effort into this instead of buying up properties that you can then sell to a developer who can create residential units downtown that will bring people in. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Have a question? Mr. Chairman, I just want to remind everyone there's a memo from the town planner as part of this package that explains how uh, this fits in with the planning and zoning efforts with the housing incentive zone as well as uh, the overlay zones to encourage a uh, denser population in the downtown. I'd like to see that. There, are, uh, there are a lot of balls in the air, a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, a lot of groups. You see the amount of economic development director, um, recruiter, um, this is a good thing at least a year before we're ready to entertain what a tenant build out may look like. Maybe it's one, maybe it's several. Um, I think we're just trying to keep the ball. I'm going to be rude. I'm going to be rude and say Just please at least come to the mic then. So everybody can hear you. No, Lucille, as someone who lives downtown, people are here. They are here. There are enough people here, but there's quite a few people here. But they're you know, I've been looking at the downtown since 1983. I can see it in my sleep. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to regret this. 
You're going to regret it big time. I'm telling you now. I thought you won't be here by the time you won't look back and say, you know what, she was right. But I've been doing this. I've been involved in the downtown since 1983. I worked with every planner. And I worked with planners out of Wallingford. And I worked with developers who do this kind of thing. And they would tell me, if the guy who owns this craft was here right now, Mr. Smart, he would tell you, you're making a mistake. You're coming at it from the wrong end. But that's just, you know, you do what you want, as the council always does, or the administration always does. I can stand up here and talk to my blue in the face, but I don't think one of you up there has been working on the downtown since 1983, except probably the mayor. So, when, since when he got in, I got in. Oh, come over five more you drive. Um, there's nobody here from the grant department in our town. Any other questions? Are these guys people? Or you? The grant hasn't been completed. It will be sent once we know that we have approval to apply for it. Okay. Um, I've got some concerns about what's actually taking place. First of all, why are we, do, do we have to keep selling the building? What was your question? Did we entertain selling the building? No. Why? Because the historic structure is very symbolic of Wallingford. Uh, we, we are not, at this point, interested in selling the building. So we had one right next door that was about ready to fall down that the state ended up suing us and then you allowed to totally get deteriorated. But we sold that. But we, we still have the ability to sell. I, I'm, I'm confused. Mr. Governor, if I can interject, but we, we did not entertain in any significant manner selling it. I think I was in a meeting and we said, should we sell it? Everybody's like, no. And then we moved on. So it was brought up. It's not like it wasn't discussed. But everybody in the room, nobody was interested. But if it's so valuable, why wouldn't we sell But why are we taking the taxpayer money of the state of Connecticut plus ours, dumping $3.5 million into a building, and then just saying, well, we're just going to throw darts at it, maybe somebody will come, and while we're sitting there waiting, we have, we have no idea what it's going to be. I asked this question before, it has yet to be answered. I'm sorry, is it Mr. Silver? Hypothetically, I know people don't want to answer hypothetical questions, but say a successful business comes in, Steakhouse, and it's highly successful. Was there any type of traffic pattern in, in any of this design? Because my question is, is say U.S. Food comes in with an 18 wheeler, the channel distributor comes on the other side with their, with their truck, then you've got Pat Frieda down in, in New York coming out, dropping off their or why we risk it. So you're, you have such a congestion of traffic and nowhere for them to park. Was, was that part of a feasibility study done? Sir Comfort, I think you're right. We don't want to get into all the hypotheticals. We're in the process of, of de developing the site. This is one of many stages that we've gotten to. We have more than we've gone through to go. And it's no real developer coming in would have would know what tenants, what commercial tenants they were going to have this time. So, so no, no different than they would know what tenants were going to be living in apartments that they were deciding to build. But we want the building to be successful. But we still, it, it still has yet to be answered. Where are all these suppliers going to go to, to supply all the, the, the goods that are going to be supplying the successful usage of this building? Where are they, where are they supposed to go? We don't know that that's what's going to be used for. Um, part of this, this grant application, uh, which is due on October 7th, which is what, a week and a half away, that's when it's due, correct, right? Amen. I believe. I believe so. Okay, so it's due in a, in a week and a half. And I, I also agree with Mr. Tesla. Why are we rushing this? This whole thing just got dumped on your lap. $3.5 million. And you guys, it, yeah, it sounds great, but at the, at, at the end of the day, I was here when you guys all, all the town council wanted, all the, we want to be part of the input. 
We want to have saved in this thing. As far as I know, you guys have no saved. I haven't, I haven't attended one meeting where you guys said, well, this, this is our envision. This is what we'd like to see. What I'm saying is, hey, we need three and a half million dollars to, 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 to move forward with this. We still don't know what it's going to be. Where is the feasibility study for this? No one knows? But you're supposed to supply one on your application on October 7th. The drawings provided by Mr. Silver and his firm are what will answer the questions as far as what the town's plans are. I don't know what you mean by feasibility study. Uh, we submit plans and drawings and, and uh, hopefully a shovel ready project. That's what we're obligated to do and we believe it meets all the terms of the grant. Okay, that's the reason why I asked if anybody in our town that is familiar with the grants was here because they should be answering these questions. If you go, you guys have internet, if you go on the Connecticut website for this particular grant, there's 27 page document that the town administrator has to fill out. And one of them says, feasibility of project, discuss market demand for the proposed use. Market demand study. So clearly one's supposed to be there, but we don't even know if it exists. And it says, provide at least five examples of similar scale projects that the applicant team has undertaken, including references. Who is the applicant team? This is town of Walker, and we have not undertaken a similar project, uh, to my knowledge, uh, certainly not since I've been involved in town government, maybe sometime prior to that, but this is unique. Okay, but it says that you have to supply the information for at least five of them. And then it says if DEC, excuse me, if DECD um, funding was used, complete, completed on time on budget, project issues and how they were resolved. Project testimonials. I, I don't want to take up any more of your time because I can see where this is going. But one, one of the issues here is, is that am I to correct to believe that if this thing failed, which I don't think that it's going to, but I think it should, if it did fail, that you're prepared, Mayor, to spend $1.116 million to get that exterior of that building up to the standard by which these guys are saying it needs just as far as corrective maintenance? The town would be obligated as, as those repairs are needed they're not all needed right now, but much of the improvements that have been made are now aged in process. And as the roof or the windows or whatever else might fail, we would be uh, looking to keep it in good repair. That doesn't mean we'll spend all that one time, but we are obligated to maintain that building and that's what we'll do. Okay, so I thought I read an article in the newspaper where you said, well, even if we don't get the grant, we've got to spend on 1.116 in, in maintenance. But this goes this go back to my point, even back when I tried to get the, the building maintenance committee. If, if we still had that, this would have never been gotten to the situation that, that it's in right now. As far as the leaks, based upon Mr. Silver's report, it says that. Um, or the pages here. Replacement of spalling portions of brick veneer and mortar joints due to water infiltration. From our visual inspection, the damage of the brick veneer appears to be from water intrusion. Adding gutters, which were originally on the building, will aid in preventing future water damage to the facade. Whatever happened to those gutters, why weren't they put back on? Clearly, his, his visual inspection said that if they were there, I don't want to speak the words as well then this problem wouldn't have happened. Is that the case? At one time I was informed that there were not gutters originally on the building, and so they were removed. Since then, other records indicate that there were gutters, so they can be returned. Um, I against this. I want to be on the record. I want, I want this 
take the go to DECD because I want to be on the record that we did our biggest project that we had recently through DECD was the Center Street Center Terminal Building. And I wanted to be on record through DECD that three years after the signing off on this project, there were problems that were, were signed off by the architect, the administration, public works, and the contractor. I waited three years, I brought it up, because of me, the taxpayer, the whole exterior of the building had to get redone. And that was oversight by all the people that signed off on it. And it says that if anybody has any testimonials that they're supposed to be submitted. I want, I want that in there, as well as the stuff that I provided the town council with the pictures of it. And I also want to be on the record because I think that if we went down to that building today, you still see a problem with the exterior of the building after it was repaired again. That was two years ago. Thank you. Mr. Gross, did you want to return to my comments? Is there anybody else that wants to make comments? We're over the, the time limit. Is it Mr. Gross, it would be quick for work. Mr. Gross, do you want to go first? <clears throat> Girls along the road. Two things. One is, why is it just this building? Why aren't we like other communities that have submitted applications to the state of Connecticut? We have the opportunity to see what other communities have sent and were approved for. They just didn't take one building. They involved all the, all the other owners and buildings in the area and went into a grant with them because housing is a big component of this. And why aren't we going, if this is going to be the gateway and all that type of stuff, to Mr. Zinsky's point, you need people downtown. This grant allows you to go into contract with landowners, apartment owners, whoever you want to call, and allows you to go 50-50 with them to renovate those areas and fix it up and make it really look nice. And that will bring people in permanent tenants. And why aren't we wait, doing any weight bonding down there? Why aren't we having any of this in this ramp? It just seems that it's just this building, but if you look at all the other applications, it's much more. It's, a, it's, a, it's an area. Sometimes it's city block long that they're redoing. And I think we're missing a big opportunity. I mean, I know you're voting for this. I'm not. I mean, I understand all that. But we're missing the big opportunities we always seem to do. We're not going for the full enchilada here. We're just going for a little piece of the pie where we have the opportunity to develop that whole lower hall, that whole lower uh, upper hall, and put it in the area. And then and you've got about those landlords and talk to them. You really could have done something nice down there, just instead of just one building. Thank you. It makes anybody feel better. I've been in meetings about using this building for this since years before the pandemic. I mean, this has been a long time. A lot of the landlords in the area have been talked to. Um, the board of editor talked to Dr. Mento back when he was here for years. Uh, I mean, we're talking about at least four years. So this is a new program where they're offering 50%. I understand. But if you're a landlord in the area, it's really easy to mind when he was here. There are constant constant talks and negotiations. But the way they're finding they're the electric, not there. That's not the project we chose. This well, is what we're doing. Didn't they add the wayfinding and add the electric car stations and all those type of things, those are ours. And those should have been included also. Thanks. Yes, please. I just have one question which I asked initially and then I got talking and I never got an answer. And I'm hoping I'll get an answer. Sure. I so rarely get an answer. What is your long-term goal by developing this one particular building. What is the long-term goal for downtown Wallingford? Go ahead. The long-term goal is in the POCD, the Planner Conservation Development, uh, and one of the goals was that we develop the transition in this manner. Uh, that can be discussed this. Um, yes. There are a lot of balls in the air, and this is just the one that we're discussing tonight. Well, I would think that you'd be able to say to me, we feel if we do this, 
25 years down the road, 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, we'll have the vibrant downtown. Downtown. I'm a native. I still call it downtown. I don't call it lower center street. I call it downtown. That we'll have the vibrant downtown that we have been working for for so many years. This project is not it. I disagree, but thank you. That is the end of the follow up question. Answer period by a four ten minutes. Any other co comments or questions back to the council? Councilor Chris Fine. So presently, this building is used by the government. And certainly, it has a purposeful use, used for health education. Um, my vision is that it looks better, that it is brought up to code, and that it has more of a non-governmental function in our downtown area. So, you know, certainly we aren't putting in rugs uh, because we don't know what a future tenant and our tenants are going to want in that regard. Certainly a future tenant, uh, you know, this is the first step from my perspective on developing this property. If a future tenant comes to us and says, hey, you know, electric charging stations might be great in that, that lot back there, you know, we can help us in, in doing that with the partner, you know, that would be as part of the next step. This is the beginning. This is to bring Shell to a state that we can say to a third party, um, would you like to be part of our community? They may be a part of our community now and maybe want to move into this space. But it would be, from my perspective, irresponsible for us to develop the property at a level that curtails Barriers. Tenant go into this building, um, and all of those concerns. You know, if it's one restaurant, and you know, we've been talking about, uh, you know, how they can offload bread and meat at the same time. Is there enough room? This is very similar to the process that we went through with the American Legion building, which a lot of us were here for. Um, I was up here. Um, you know, we had a building that was owned by the town. We said to the public, "Come to us and and make." proposals on how we utilize this property. And that's essentially what I see is what we're doing here. The American Legion building, we toured it, it was nowhere near a state of renting at that time. Uh, we are making this property more attractive for someone to partner with us and to make our lower downtown area more vibrant. So that's my perspective. Yeah, I, I just wanted to also also address you know some of the questions. I mean, I the the way I look at at Walnut Center, and, and you do call it downtown. I I have, I love the habit to call it uptown and downtown. I, I consider everything at the top of the hill uptown, and everything going down lower center is part of the downtown, and. Um, I, I've lived in this town my entire life. And I've watched that entire Center Street change. Um, um, in, the, in the 70s, there were a lot of little mom and pop stores, and, and that's what brought, drew people at the time downtown, up and down Center Street. And, and Ms. Kestrani is absolutely right. As, those, as, those, as the people's habits changed, those stores didn't survive anymore. And they closed up in favor of other things. And I would like to see the, the vision in the future that I would like to see is, is a lot more business that gets attracted that is that is what we'll call street worthy or foot worthy. Because what I see today is a lot of shops that close at four o'clock in the afternoon. There's a few elements that are open after that, but not many. Even some of the restaurants close their kitchens at nine, and the buildings are closed at 10:30. And 11. The, the downtown area doesn't maintain because those businesses are, are very limited in what they do. And I, I do agree with her that without having a population that lives there is part of the problem. 
There's already a lot of uh, well, ancillary population around there. The, the Judge Street condominiums, the Parker Place condominiums, but there's nothing to really bring them into Wallingford Center after 9 p.m. We'll leave here. If I'm hungry after this meeting, all the kitchens are closed. I can't get a thing to eat. In the 80s, I could do it till 11 o'clock at night on a Tuesday. So I, I think there's a mix here. Um, Ms. Kasper also brought up Milford. Now, Milford had a situation where Smithcraft came in and bought up the properties. We have been driving at that a long time. We have a different situation here in Delaware. Every property is a little bit of patchwork. So could the town have been buying up along the way? Technically, that's what we've been doing around the Brothers parking lot since the 50s. Every time a building came up, we bought it. And we owned pieces of those properties all the way around with the Brothers parking lot there. When, when a store became uh, available, it was bought. There was only a few properties left there now. But we, we can't just go and force them to buy, uh, force them to sell, I should say, and make it available town about to clear the entire lot. There, there are, there's only so much the town can do purchasing privacy. Otherwise, developers would do it. I, I agree that it would be great if a developer came in and did this over time. Bought up the property, and then bought the adjacent property, and built a big area so that we could utilize the zoning, the overlay zone that we've got there. And that is sort of what they did over at Park Place. They utilized all that space for that. There are people that are there now. They're not coming downtown. People at Judge Square, there's only so many of them that are coming down. We need, we need something that will bring more people downtown. I don't, I would have to defer to experts that know better than I do if more people is that answer or something that is a draw. I'd like to believe that by tending to do both things and to add other elements, talk about the charging station. By, by nature of people that own those automobiles, they'll park them, they'll charge them, and they'll go someplace. I do that today. So there's all these little elements that we should be bringing together. I think that's part of the whole plan. And I think that this building is a piece of it. So I'm looking forward to seeing this move forward as a part of that plan. And then all of the other things that we can add on, ancillary to, to Build up this area. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you. Madam Clerk, you call the roll. Please. Harmony? Yes. Ishmael? Yes. Moreau? Yes. Tad? Yes. Tessa? Yes. Sandra? Yes. Chairman Lack? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, the next agenda item uh, is Councilor Carmody's. Uh, the EDC may want to turn around. Those might have comments on it, uh, but it is notifying local profit, nonprofit and business entities of the opportunity and procedure to apply for funds. Want to start with a little? Yeah. Feel? Sure. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we all know, we are moving along with the ARPA process. Um, and, and something that we really haven't discussed up here that I can remember is um, the way we're going to notify the nonprofits and business entities that sort of falling for. And so I wanted to at least start that conversation this evening. Um, I, I think to make this process as transparent as possible and to make as many nonprofits and businesses have the opportunity to apply for funds. Uh, that we should publicize the application process in the web portal to the fullest extent that we can. Um, I know that the web portal is supposed to go live the first week of October, and so I don't know if the town has had plans to notify businesses or nonprofits in any form, um, but I want to talk about uh, doing just that um, if it, that conversation hasn't been had by other entities. Um, I think, just to skip all here, but I, I think one of the easiest ways to do this is obviously to put notifications in our electric bills. Um, and so that's where I wanted to start, just with that idea, and let's see what the council had in mind. In my recollection, maybe part of it came up in some of the, the subcommittee when we had one 
um, is that uh, the electric bills, EDC uh, currently is putting together a marketing plan for it. Um, we're also going to go to the press. And, and then, as Councilor Sandry said, I think the last week, you know, he was going to blow up social media. So, um, sure, I don't know, but I have a formal um, motion to put notifications in our electric bill. But I, I just think. Not everyone watches these council meetings, not everyone reads the regular journal. I want to make sure that every business and every nonprofit, especially, is aware of this opportunity that they can apply to the council. Is that an actual motion? Yeah, sure. I'll, 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 well, I'll make a motion that all elected customers receive notification of the opportunity to apply for ARPA funds and instructions on how to access what? Moved by Councilor Carmody, seconded by that's the Councilor Tessa, do you want to comment? Or no, you're all set. Okay. Okay, well, for it. Councilor Fishbein and Councilor Tessa. Four. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm in support of the notification thing, um, but I would have expected that as part of this agenda item that we would get, you know, it's not like this weekend, October 1. So, We'd be October 10th to go. Okay. We're talking October. to themselves today. It's going to go on October 10th. And what's the window for which? Um, the council had approved 60 days. So it's October. One of the prior ones, we're going to do it in 60 days. We've been talking to the consultant, we had made it shorter, and then I realized that you had actually had approved 60 days. So it's going to be a 60 day window. Um, I do think we need to check for the electric division as to whether or not they can. Isolate business bills because that's another way they would go, so we can check that. Okay, how do we deal with nonprofits then? I mean, we just not submit it into well, every they, electric bill? They wouldn't be in a separate um, category, I think, from businesses in terms of the electric. I just don't know if electric can pull out and just send the notice to the business nonprofit side versus individuals. I don't so understand. You have to check that. I don't understand the harm in letting. A private individual know that perhaps the business that they work for, perhaps the nonprofit they volunteer at, is able to do this. So it would make it easier that way. I mean, everybody should get it. Um, but then you get to the um, is there a flyer that's out there that's been approved? Um, because we, you know, there's one thing. You know, notice comes in various forms, right? Um, I think the, e well, the EDC was working on marketing to businesses, so. Um, well, we've got, we're just talking about the electric bill thing right now. Oh. Is there a flyer that somebody has presented? Because we certainly haven't gotten anything. No, we, I have not that idea. It hasn't been made yet. Okay. If, if, if that could be done. Yeah, I mean, if time permits, I'd like to be able to see it. Um, I, you know, I'm not looking to micromanage, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are many <laughs> <there. laughs> <laughs> One could argue the motion itself is micromanaging, and I didn't make it. Or I said, so we are going to make that argument. Um, I'll make it on the other one. You know, I totally agree with you. The spirit. Uh, there should be, you know, something out there. I mean, I would be going to the consultant and uh, asking them if they have a standard mean that we could modify for Wallingford and make that like the, the poster child for this. Uh, you know, so that everybody knows. So that's the picture that's always associated with the Wallingford product. You know, stuff like that. The marketing campaign. Um, you don't even have anything. <laughs> um, so I, I'm in support of the motion. You know, I don't, I'm hoping that we don't need to go down every vehicle and make motions with regard to all of them. Um, but I, I would like, at least like to see what is intended to go on. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Any other questions, comments, concerns, comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm wondering about the, well, I was thinking we should also be making note of the 
the third aspect, which is the government projects, but I'm still uncertain as to who will be able to apply for those. So do we do we know what that process is yet? Because I'm thinking if, if individuals or citizens or can apply for them, then we would also want to note that too, that they would also go to this website and be able to either put ideas or submit, but I'm not sure what that process is at this time. I don't know that the public would have enough information to propose a public project and costs and all that other stuff. I think that's probably a us problem. So are the, so are, are, is it council who is going to be proposing those ultimately? Well, I'm not the one to answer that question because I argued against it. Municipal projects would follow the same process they always do, which would mean the administration will provide uh, suggestions and they have to be agreed to between council and administration. Okay. And so if a council wanted to suggest something, they would just notify your office and then you would ultimately decide and then send it back to us if we, want, if we chose to do that? Uh, who, who is doing this? If, if, if one of us were to say, you know, Mr. Mayor, we would like you to consider this, yeah. we would just contact you and then you'll right. ultimately let us know. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, that was fantastic. Okay. Now, since we got on that story, and then talk, because we, I thought we all, I thought the decision here was that we then had to submit it to the committee. Right? It's not on the agenda. I know. It's, yeah. It's, 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 we haven't gotten there. I'm just saying. We, we haven't gotten there. I know what you're saying. That's how I wanted it. We, Come up with an idea, we talk about it, we propose it to the mayor, and there's, well, I'm off, let's, let's talk about this together. But we agreed that we then have to get, get it approved by the committee. So we this is a decision for another meeting. It's a big discussion we have to have that one I think. But I see where you're going. I I, I think you really opening up a big can and say, okay, we want to let everybody know, hey, we start proposing projects. No, we're going to kick the can down the road far enough for that. So I didn't see in any of your votes on that meeting that I left that that, you know, I gave you, I drafted from what I could glean from the minutes as to what you wanted. I didn't have a response. Um, so since there seems to be some discussion that's continuing, is it all right not to put that in the portal at this time? Because I don't know that the government project comes in one of the four. All right, that's I that I didn't think they should, but I didn't know that that was the case, so it's not the case. Was it discussed at the first committee? Like way back up. No, no, I mean, did, did, did I There's nothing in the minutes that gave me any indication yeah. that that was the case. I just I never understood that. I meant to ask for a report on that, but I didn't get a chance to get it up again. Yeah, I mean, I gave the video to the town clerk. It was supposed to be uploaded, and I believe the contract. Um, but in answer to your question, the, the result of the meeting was that there hasn't been enough direction from this body as to that aspect of the application. That's right. Well, that's good. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the motion on the table? Council Member Rowe. And I apologize to come to the chairman. I agree with William Rowe. But the public projects, but you know, part of what the consultants part of this part of what they talked about is the idea of equity between the, the different banks of money and whatnot. And some of us up here have political ambitions that are sort of the short term, and some have political ambitions in the long term. But I think that uh, removing some of the, the sort of politics of what projects get approved or get ranked from the council. I mean, we we can make it. We can approve a project with the mayor at the time, right? If he was willing to move forward with the project, we could do any project with or without the art. So I think the idea of the equities that you rank the projects in in, um, in comparison to everything else that they're looking at, or in comparison to each other, because you may have that project that you're really in favor of that they don't feel is in the spirit of the ARPA money or the or or whatnot. So no one's given away any authority or power. The the suggestion that this body is is in every circumstance the best to make these decisions, I find a little bit dubious because there's some of us that have ambitions that aren't necessarily that might drive you in a particular direction. There's projects that I've seen over the years that I sort of feel 
close to that are figured out the, in the best interest of you know, the harbor front. So that's why I think why the council voted to give that authority to the committee. And again, we could reject everything that they do outright at the end. Right? It's all going to come back to us for the final say. So um, that's a good chair. Um, I think the, um, I mean, I think it's kind of laughable to think that the committee would not be involved in politics at all whatsoever either. Um, but the council, and I think as Mr. Pesto and I argued kind of before, is that we are the legal authority. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what makes us different than, than everybody else. Um, we get elected every two years, and that, um, that's where that goes. But, um, so I guess the, the committee will review or whatever um, when that time comes. Um, after all the applications have been submitted, are there any other comments on this motion going to the public, Mr. Gross? Bob Gross, Long Hill Road. I know I mentioned this before, but EDC's here and the mayor's here make they go. Do you know how many businesses there are in town that are registered and how many 501c3s are registered in the town? Approximately, is it less than 5,000? Okay, why don't we, because some don't get electric bills. I have a tenant that I pay the electricity for this commercial. So, um, they don't get electric bill. Oh. Uh, Jim Wolf, uh, EDC. There's 2,100 small businesses registered in town. All right, and that is, I don't know if that, Sure, so we can just stand the mic a little bit more or pull it up. So that there's 2,100 small businesses now, and I'm not sure if that includes nonprofits or not. So, with that, I mean, the town has to have the database because they tax us, they send us letters, and they know who we are, who small businesses are. So, why does the easiest way would be to send everybody a letter? And that would be the easiest way that you know everybody. Because if you wanted to be fair and equitable, something, and it should be done in two languages, it should be done in Spanish and English, and it should be sent to everybody, and the 501c3s. You don't want somebody coming in on December 20th or whatever day in December saying, I didn't know anything about it. This is the fair and equitable way to do it. And it's not, it's not a big cost, and our would pay for it anyway. It's less money. Then what you could spend it on the consultant so far. If you got five thousand to send out, what can it cost you? Five hundred dollars? Three thousand bucks? So it would be the best way to do it to get everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the comment? Short comment. Then Mr. Dover. Yeah, I have a question about the Edgerton Road. Uh, I really appreciate this agenda item so that you can have some to put this on here because I do think 60 days, considering how long we've been at this process, is not a lot of time. And if we look back at what we've heard multiple times with multiple businesses missing out on applying for PPP money, for instance, previously, it's understandable business owners, especially small business owners, are spread thin, but that onus falls on us as a town for failing to notify them properly. This is money that was available. This is an opportunity to not fail again. And so I think it's, I implore the council to leave, and the administration to leave no stone unturned in terms of marketing this. I think uh, putting out a letter with the electric bills is a good idea, it's a good start, but it's only a start. I hear on almost a daily basis, I'm sure the town councilors get this a lot too, from nonprofits who operate primarily, not wholly, at Wallingford, who have no idea, no idea, we're two weeks away, they have no idea that this potential money is out there. Many nonprofits don't have a physical location. Their presidents, their board members might not even live in town, even if their nonprofit is registered and functions primarily in Wallingford. I can think of several off the top of my head, many of whom have been here multiple times throughout this process. So, the, uh, including this flyer, the bill is a great start. I would like to see, you know, using newspaper publications like the Record Journal is another way. Uh, I just fear that 
our town's historic aversion to technology and not having potentially an email list for these groups, etc. Um, I really want to make sure we're not leaving any so behind because the only way that this is going to be a fair process, an equitable process, is if everyone knows there's a process, if everyone knows this opportunity is out there. So I realize, I know all the councilors do um, care deeply about this, but time is of the essence here, so I really hope that we, if it requires putting some money behind it to get that message out there, then let's do that. And let's do that now. Because even if, if a business hears about this 50 days into a 60 day period, they very well might have the time uh, and a busy schedule as is to get that done. So um, I appreciate the agenda item and hope we look, look further um, in terms of what we can do. Thank you. Sorry. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Sean Dory, Wallingford County YMCA, and also the line two minutes on Hill Road, Wallingford County. Uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for all your tireless efforts uh, in regards to this uh, topic for discussion and uh, all your all your efforts. Um, on behalf of businesses and the nonprofits, uh, if you have this information to share, I'm trying to kind of follow the timeline along. Uh, you mentioned October 10th as a uh, application open. Uh, December 10th as a deadline. Um, at some point in time, we can kind of talk about a technical assistance. Is, if that's going to be communicated as well through uh, all the businesses and nonprofits. Uh, and also, after the December 10th uh, deadline, uh, then what happens and what is that timeline uh, for basically decisions and all that kind of stuff? I don't know if we're ready to have that uh, response tonight or if you can include that in your. I, I, mm -hmm. We were originally going with early October. We are talking now about the 10th as we know things are firming up um, for the businesses and nonprofits. 60 days after that, um, when that goes live, we'll be part of the marketing. Um, and as you know, you've been in our meeting. Um, stop us from preventing the wire from getting any of the money. So, um, yeah, no, it'll be aware. And then the, it's up to the review committee. They're not allowed to review any of the applications until all the periods have closed and everything's been catered. So uh, it'll have to be a process after that. It's right before the holidays. I'm going to guess it's not going to be until the year, but I doubt they're going to be meeting two weeks before Christmas. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would just suggest if you really think about it, as soon as the applications start coming in and have the review done, you don't make a decision. Well, yeah. Okay. We're, we're, we're going to back this okay. thing up. We are. Okay. We are even signed the back up. Last time we were going to back this thing up in January, February, March. Correct. Right. Any other questions from the public? Seeing none, back to council. Councilor Tatum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I I know the consultant has spoke on this too, and I don't know how exactly we communicate this to him or ask him this, but um, he's done it for a lot of municipalities. I know. He already knows, or you know, this company already knows um, the different outlets they use to advertise this. So I'm sure if we just communicate to him that we want this, um, you know, publicized it, it, as much as possible, and, you know, I'm sure he would give us a bunch of ideas. Um, the electric bill, I think, is a unique one because not a lot of the other talents maybe have that benefit um, if they don't have, you know, mail or that's going out to, to that. Portion of the population. So I like that idea also. And I think each one of the ideas probably won't hit every single person, but in totality, if we use all of these different uh, methods, hopefully everybody is informed. So um, I'm not sure how we inform the consultant or who would allow the consultant to say we want these methods used. Or maybe he's just already doing that. And so they don't do the advertising. That would be us. <laughs> But they can give us the idea. Yeah, I have like, no problem so contacting them and saying, you see, you know, what, I, what ways have we seen people do it? Different talents do it. We can do that. Right. And then we'll also, you know, I had given you a memo with a rough estimate of the timeline, but that was when I thought it was going to be less than 60 days. So we'll give me another time to wait and I'll talk to the consultants about that and we'll, we'll have that. And, you know, we put it in the flyer. Obviously, we're going to say that this is estimated. So, I mean, until you know how much you're going to get in and stuff, you know. 
Councilor Fishman. So now the motion that's on the table is a direction to a town department that is not present here to opine on whether or not the timeline is doable or the date. It's more of a recommendation, right? Since we don't have that authority. Yeah, I, well, I don't know that that's the way the motion was structured. So, so I, I just don't know, like, when they do this, when they would need a mail, when they would need copies of this thing to get inserted, you know, what are the logistics, is this doable, that kind of stuff, which is usually what we would have if this was on an agenda that was noted. So, anybody have that information? And we will pursue getting it done, and if there's a problem, well, then we'll work with the problem. And at this point, the critical thing is having, having a document that can be inserted. So whatever details are associated with that, obviously the size of the piece of paper, et cetera, I, I don't know if the weight of it becomes a factor, but we'll have to find out. Councilor Fishman is available to draft that document. Absolutely. I'll have it done by midnight if you want. Um, Okay, I just, you know, we know who we are. I don't know that a motion is necessarily necessary, but. Uh, I was going to say that at the beginning. Yeah, it sounds like it's just. Yeah, I'm sure. sure. I mean, I'll, I'll withdraw the motion, um, but I just wanted to have a conversation to make sure that something is being done to notify all these entities in town. If we run into problems, let me know. Thank you. So, are you going to withdraw it? Gonna... Yes, I, I'll withdraw it. All right, draw it in for the second. So. Great. Any other comments on this? Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, when, when the portal opens up for the application, we're going to get a link for this, and I presume it will go on the town website? Well, all right, so, I mean, that's another avenue. Yeah, I, I agree with everybody else. It's important to kind of try to blanket this, but I, I, I would think that between a mailer, a website, um, you know, a lot of the nonprofits already know. I, I, I don't know how we can miss it. I'm sure the Record Journal is going to do an article on it. So I, mean, I can't think of another way of it short of making phone calls. So I, I appreciate the diligence, but I, I think we're hitting all the bases here. I think we're doing the best we can. And I get an email every other day, so. Yeah, I do too, I hear you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing that they've done. Item number 10 uh, was withdrawn from tonight. We'll be moved to a, a future meeting. Number, item number 11. I entertain, uh, I will entertain a motion to go into executive session pursuant to general connected statute section 1-225F and section 1-206B regarding strategy and negotiation, excuse me, negotiations with respect to the following pending litigations. Wallingford Group LLC versus Town of Wallingford, 315 North Cherry Street Extension LLC versus Town of Wallingford, and the Hillsville Properties LLC versus Town of Wallingford. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilor Fishbein, seconded by Councilor Sandry. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Any abstentions passes. We are now in the executive session. Motion to come out of executive session. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilor Sandry, seconded by Councilor Fishbein. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed nay, seeing none, we are now out of executive session. I'll entertain a motion to authorize a settlement in the pending tax appeal matter of Wallingford Group LLC versus Town of Wallingford as discussed in executive session. So moved. Second. Moved by Councillor Fishwine, second by Councillor Testa. Uh, Testa. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed nay, seeing none, motion passes. I'll entertain a motion to authorize a settlement in the pending tax appeal matter of 350 North Cherry Street Extension LLC versus Town of Wallingford as discussed in executive session. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Seeing none, passes. And the last agenda item, I uh, will entertain a motion to authorize settlement in the pending tax appeal matter of Yalesville Properties, LLC, versus Town of Wallingford, as discussed in executive session. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Seeing none, motion passes. Special thanks to the TV crew who had to handle technical issues with the cameras. And I will declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you.